the last topic uh, of the day is the development of vision. And uh, I feel a bit guilty on giving this talk with Daniela Ricci in the audience because she is really the one who has done most of the work uh, in, in Rome. And uh, this is really uh, the work of a big group uh, where it, it all started at the visual unit in London at, um, with Jan Atkinson and Oliver Braddock. And since then, we had a, a large collaboration with many centers, including Milan and Pisa. Now, if you are a neonatologist, you know that one of the uh, questions uh, parents always ask is, uh, what can my baby see? Does he see, a, she, he, she or see at all? And uh, that they see shadows, that they see contrast, what do they see? And uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to give an answer, but in the last uh, 15 years, uh, we have been able to uh, develop a number of tests that have given us some uh, uh, information on the development of different aspects of vision. So we know when different aspects of vision appear, uh, at, the, at what age they appear, and also um, we have been able to assess all these aspects in uh, normal populations, but also in children with lesions, and trying to understand what is the correlation between different parts of the brain and different aspects of vision. So we are in a better position now to understand uh, what is the development of vision in low-risk infants uh, and also what is uh, the role that these aspects of vision play in more general aspects of development. Uh, so what I will try to discuss today is a bit of a very little of anatomy of the visual pathway with new concepts that we have acquired ov over the last few years uh, and new methods of assessment, uh, trying also to go into correlation between structures and function in infants with lesions. And most of the second part will be on early visual assessment. You are all neonatologists, so I'm sure you all want to know more of what we can do in neonates already uh, soon after birth. Uh, now, um, you are all, most of you are much younger than I am, but at the time when I was at school, uh, at medical school, we were told that the visual pathway was a very straightforward uh, visual <coughs> pathway, starting from the eyes, then the optic nerves, and then crossing, and then going straight to the occipital lobe uh, where the uh, primary visual cortex area is. Uh, and life was quite easy when we knew these things. Uh, things have become much more complicated <coughs> because now we know that it's not only the the occipital cortex, but there is a D1, but there is only D2, and there is always a parietal lobe that is very much involved in the frontal lobe, and but also what about the connection with the temporal and the dorsal stream and the ventral stream and so on. So we have realized that vision is a much more complex uh, system where there are different aspects of visual, of visual function. And uh, also that is not all cortical, but there are several cortical areas and several subcortical areas which are related to different aspects of visual function. And uh, we know that all these aspects can be tested. These are a few examples of what we do in uh, children uh, from birth, really, but especially after three months. Uh, these are acuity cards. Uh, how, how many of you have ever seen or used acuity cards? Uh, so a few of, of you, you already know. And these are based uh, on the concept that uh, if we put a baby, even a newborn, in front of uh, a, a card like this, where there is a, a, a gray background and a stripe background, there is an inborn preference to go for the stripes rather than to the uh, continuous background. And uh, using different stripes of, di of, different, uh, um, uh, of, of different sides, uh, you can have a, a sort of gross measure of acuity. And this is a test we like a lot. It's, it's called uh, uh, fixation shift. And uh, you can see the ability of the child to explore the, to, to, to shift the attention from a central target to a peripheral target. And this is very easy when the central target disappears, like in this part where there is it's called known competition. But it becomes more difficult when the central target is still there at the time when the peripheral one appears. So this is called competition. And while this is, uh, easy subcortical, you can already find it soon after birth, you have to wait up to four or five months to have uh, these responses. Uh, these are visual fields, the child is in front of a central stimulus and then you go from the periphery at 90 degrees on each side uh, and you enter with a target and you see when the child can see and you measure the angle. So you can already measure angles of visual fields already at one month, three months. Uh, and then you can record more structure responses, uh, electrophysiological responses to stimuli like shift of phase of shift uh, of uh, orientation. And uh, um, what we know, this is the visual acuity. I already gave you 
uh, an example of uh, that is a, the inborn capacity to prefer a target with high contrast. And uh, that's how we do. And you have all these stri all these stripes at different uh, uh, spatial frequency. And the last uh, level of stripes that the child can see, you know, the, the can see consistently, is the measure of acuity. And uh, we have normative data, so you can uh, see how if, if the what the child is doing uh, uh, according to already in uh, uh, very few weeks of gestational age uh, is uh, appropriate for his age. And these are the visual, this is the visual fields apparatus, it's a homemade apparatus. <coughs> there are many people from Holland, uh, uh, so th we, we need to acknowledge that this was, was developed by Jack Ivanov van Duin. And it's a very simple method, and even babies at one month, two months, will be able to participate into this game. <coughs> and again, this is the Jackie old picture that we are still using. At one month, visual fields are quite restricted, and the older the child gets, in two months, six months, uh, 11 months, you see that it becomes much wider and more similar to adults. And this is the fixation shift again. This is an important test because this is the first test of visual attention that you have. And now we are playing a lot with this because uh, this may identify children. I mean, we, when with three terms, we have a lot of three terms at the three or four years develop attention problems. And this is the first test uh, where we they are really abnormal already at five months or one year. And this test is very simple. You put the child in front of a television and uh, then you have a central target and then you have two paradigms. In the first one, the, the, the stripes on the side appear, but the central target has disappeared, so it's really easy, non it's a non-competition, it's subcortical, it can already be found uh, soon after birth, while this one is more complex because they are both at the same time, uh, and this we know it's mediated by the parietal cortex, and uh, usually, consistently, you can only find it in children after the age of four months, four to five months. Uh. Why is this important? Because this really gives an idea of the maturation from subcortical to cortical response and of specific areas that are not related to the occipital cortex. And again, this is very important in babies because it's a measure of attention. And we know how many of preterm infants or of children with other disorders will have attention problems when they grow up. Um, and we know from other studies that it's really related to the, the, to the parietal lobe. Now, we have learned then that the, the anatomy of visual pathway is much more complex than just optic radiations and primary visual cortex. So we have tried to correlate uh, different aspects of function to, uh, to, to different uh, uh, parts of the brain. And uh, this, this all started with normal children and uh, we have a sort of calendar of when we should expect uh, changes in all these responses. Now, these are months in a age uh, in months, uh, and you can see that the acuity, you can already measure acuity in the first month, but consistently between four and five months, you see an improvement, uh, and after five months, uh, you really see the children can do much better. It's the same with visual fields. After four or five months, they are still restricted. After five months, there is this improvement and then remain stable. Five to six months is also the time of competition uh, or when you get more mature response on, uh, uh, on uh, evoked potential. So it really looks like for the first three, four months, uh, children are mainly, mainly using, uh, I'm not saying only, but mainly using their subcortical system, and by the age of four or five months, they are integrating more mature cortical responses. Uh, so this is what uh, John Atkinson uh, wrote already in 1984, that we have a subcortical visual system working at birth, uh, and the, the cortex start to function with different onset times for different systems, uh, and five, maximum six months of age is the time when these aspects are present. Uh, now, this is all nice, and uh, the, all this work on uh, children without lesions in low-risk children was, was very exciting, but uh, in 1997, 1998, we started applying JAMS tests to the children we saw at the Hammersmith with lesions. Uh, and the results were very interesting because we learned a lot at the time, it was 97, I think. Uh, so we started with children with HIE, and uh, uh, the first question was, uh, can we define normal or abnormal function according to the degree of HA? This is the grade of HA according to Sarnat and Sarnat. And what you can see is that very few of the grade three survive, and the one who survived uh, 
all had abnormal responses on all the aspects of visual field that of visual function that we were assessing. And also if you have a very mild asphyxia, grade one asphyxia according to Sarnat and Sarnat, uh, there are many chances that the, the visual development will be completely normal. Now, it's not easy here because in grade two, you can have children like this one who have completely normal results on all the aspects of vision assessed at five months and then at one year, and some others have all the aspects abnormal. So <coughs> just going back to the degree of uh, HIE will not give an answer. If, we, if, we, if a child has a grade two HIE, we cannot say whether the visual development will be normal or abnormal. It can be either normal or abnormal. So we went to look at the MRIs and trying to see whether uh, subdividing the MRIs in the same way we have subdivided them this morning for motor and cognitive development was helping us to have more details. Uh, and so you can see that normal MRI or mild or moderate white matter changes were always associated with, uh, with a normal visual development and only the severe white matter changes were associated with some degree of abnormal um, um, visual development. But if we move to the basal ganglia, again, as we have seen this morning for motor and cognitive, the presence of basal ganglia is, uh, a, a, a lesions, is a strong predictor of uh, severe visual abnormalities. Uh, and uh, what is nice that is that we did uh, this test at five months and we, and we repeated the test at one year and then again at school age. Uh, and you can see how this test already at five months are strongly predictive of what will happen at school age, so these are already mature responses, uh, and they were, there was only one, I think, or two false positives uh, that, however, uh, at, at one year uh, were already si were, were similar to school age. So um, what, what we learn from this is that uh, if uh, a child has normal visual development at five months, uh, it's uh, a reliable indicator that it will be normal at one year and at school age. Uh, and a small proportion of the one who have abnormal results early may have delayed visual maturation, but uh, by definition, delayed visual maturation improves by one year. So if you repeat <coughs> the assessment at one year, you don't have the false positives any longer. So this test can be useful. And the same applies to children with PDL. Uh, when we look at not only at optic radiations, but also at thalami involvement, uh, and uh, we found exactly the same, that the, when the thalami were also involved, uh, there was a higher chance uh, of having abnormal visual function. So we, we learned a lot about visual function, but then you say we are not uh, of, uh, ophthalmologists, we don't deal with, why should we deal with vision? And the answer comes from, from this study where we compare visual, all these aspects with visual function with uh, more general aspects of neurodevelopment two years with the Griffiths test. And we assessed 29 children with HIE. At the time, we were still allowed to say HIE. Now we would say with neonatal encephalopathy or with convulsions and hemorrhagic and ischemic lesions. And we compare the MRI, the, sorry, the visual assessment at five months with the Griffiths uh, results at two years. Uh, and. Uh, these are the number of, these are the scales of the Griffiths. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you are all familiar with the subscales of the Griffiths and with the total scores. And these are the numbers uh, of uh, tests that were abnormal on the visual assessment. So the, this is uh, zero uh, abnormalities, one abnormality, uh, two to three abnormalities, or more than three. And you can see that the developmental quotients are really related to the number of tests that were normal or abnormal. And when we did a differential um, analysis with pu putting as a covariance the, the presence of lesions, uh, the, the DQ was more related to visual, um, visual tests than to lesions on MRI. So this, this is important because vision is really, really important on all the aspects of development, including locomotor. And uh, so this is more on that, but uh, I will pull it through. Now, um, I have put only a few slides on this part because I, I thought you were more interested in assessing newborns. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, when I, was back, when I came back to Rome and I, I started working more regularly with Daniela, we, we started thinking of uh, that we really wanted something for neonates. Uh, and uh, when you think of vision in newborns, uh, how many of you do any assessment of vision in neonates? Okay, but even if you don't do a specific assessment of vision, we all use neurological tests where we, you, you, you assess at least fix, fix and follow. You know, we all use uh, a, a, a something. 
So fix and follow, uh, fixation and tracking are part of many routine examination, but uh, are they enough? And uh, this is a paper which, which was published on Lancet a few years ago by Anna Morant and Lily Dubovitz, where they found that uh, a child with, well, well, this was actually our case, but this came after a, a paper pu published in Lancet with a, with a child with holoprosencephaly and another with the large lesions where children with huge lesions and uh, with impaired not only op optic radiations but also all the, all the cortex could still fix and follow and actually they had normal flash VEP. So this gives us uh, some indication that maybe fix and follows are not sensitive enough, they are not saying enough on visual development. So we tried to see whether there were other major official function that we could already use in the neonatal unit, and we wanted to use them in the neonatal unit, but we were we wanted also to use them in uh, uh, in an incubator. So we tried to find small equipment uh, that were easy to carry and uh, and the short examination and wanted to be reliable and so on. So we started selecting tools, uh, and we didn't want anything uh, bulky or difficult. So we started with this. Uh, uh, um, with this very easy target that you can draw on your, com or your computer. And uh, uh, these are black and white contrasts because what children can really see is contrast. And uh, we, th we, all w we also wanted to know whether uh, different type of contrast could help and also if contrast to different colors, uh, I mean, if, if you are in Rome, you know, these are the colors of the Roman team. So, uh, but in Rome, there are two teams really. So you have to be careful because if they are from Lazio, you are in trouble with the families. So, so we, we try to see whether contrast to, col to different colors can also be seen, and also to see, because you can't put the big acuity cards in an incubator, you know, there is no way you can put them. So we try to see whether if we were putting the stripes uh, on some sticks, like, you know, these are tongue depression, uh, you know, all, all these things are homemade, really. If using small things like this, you could have a reliable assessment in babies. And actually we did. So we started with a large number of items and then, uh, uh, of course, Daniela was very good at all of them and she could do all of them. But then we tried other people who had less experience uh, in assessing babies or in assessing vision in babies. So we selected only the items that could be reliably used by everyone because we wanted this to be used also by someone else other than Daniela. And this is the first paper we published where we restricted the describing the development of the test and that we, did, did, we restricted restricted the items to nine that I will show in a moment. Uh, so we started looking to spontaneous ocular movements uh, and then to ocular movements with the target. And here you can see the target we use uh, and uh, what we score as responses. Uh, and then we went to see whether the fixation and the tracking, horizontal, vertical, in an arc, uh, and then you can have all these responses here and you can grade them on, on a form. And then we also started with color discrimination and attention. Again, uh, uh, the, the, the target is very simple to use and, uh, and the, the whole examination only takes five minutes. So this, this, this is the good thing because you have to, to find the, the, the child in a good state and in four or five minutes you're, you're able to do it very quickly. But we also wanted to look at uh, stripes discriminations with these little stripes uh, uh, which are uh, even uh, you know, uh, rougher as a measure of acuity and the attention at distance. If you, if you take a target and you just move it, not in the midline because otherwise, you know, children may have sticky fixation, but you move it on the side, you can see how far you can go and how far they can follow. So this is all very, very simple. So we're not talking about fancy neurophysiological techniques. We're talking of simple uh, clinical tools that you can use in everyday uh, routine assessment. Uh, and we started with the term cohort uh, uh, first, we had a, a first study on suitability of the items, and once we had the final proforma, we used in 124 in collaboration with uh, uh, Milan mainly. And uh, it was very nice to see that uh, we, we, when I say we, it's really they, were able to complete the examinations on a single, they didn't have to go back to test the children a second time. Very often, if they had an agreement with the nurses, we knew when the children had, was in between feeds uh, and so on. In 89% uh, of the cases, we're able to complete the examinations on the first go, so this gives you an idea of how easy it can be. And uh, we, start, we studied the children 48 plus uh, uh, or minus eight hours. We didn't want to do it immediately after birth. Uh, and uh, 50 of them were also randomly were re-examined at 72 hours to see whether there was any change between 48 and 72 hours. Uh, 
And I'm not giving you the, the details of this because they are all published and, and if you are interested you can go. But uh, it's interesting to see uh, that in many items the, how many children were able to have complete good responses already at 48 hours. And here you have the percentages of the children who passed the, the test. Uh, at, you know, these are different degrees of uh, uh, from normal to abnormal. And it's very nice to see that we had normative data on these populations that we use for uh, uh, when, when we were um, assessing other children. But then the next thing was that we didn't have enough. We were quite excited that this was working very well. So we said, uh, let's apply to preterm infants. So uh, again, in collaboration with Milan and with PISA, I think at this time, we studied 90 low-risk infants. So there were uh, normal ultrasound or normal MRI in, in Milan where they perform regular MRI, gestational week less than 30 weeks. Uh, and we included retinopathy stage one and two. And uh, I, I, can, I will tell you later why we did. Uh, and uh, we assess the children when they reach 35 weeks and again at term equivalent age. Uh, now, uh, these are the studies. Again, all these things have been published, so if, if you want the details, uh, but this is an example of how you can use the stripes even in incubators at 35 weeks. It's really, really simple. And uh, the results were quite exciting because they gave us an idea of the development of vision. Now, uh, if you think uh, of uh, an assessment done at 35 weeks uh, in a child who was born at less than 30 weeks and an assessment done in a full-term infant at 48 weeks, which one is going to perform better? Are they performing the same preterm born before <coughs> 30 at 35 and the full term soon after birth? Who wins? How, how many for the preterm? How many for the full term? How many think they are equal? Well, you are all right. <laughs> because uh, the, the having different aspects of vision allowed us to see there are different aspects that have a different maturation at different time. So we saw that some aspects of vision were similar in full term and preterm infants at both 35 and 40 weeks. You know, if you do horizontal tracking that we already knew was already there at 35 weeks and was not very specific, you can find it uh, already at 35. It really doesn't change at 40 weeks, and it's already the same uh, at, uh, at 40 weeks. So some aspects were already present at 35 weeks in preterm infants and were similar at 40 weeks in both preterm and full term. Some other aspects uh, had uh, a different, uh, so this is uh, the, the white line uh, is complete, the red one is incomplete and the blue line is absent. So it's normal, iffy, abnormal. And uh, we found very strange, uh, uh, well, now we know why, why this is so, but when we started, we found very strange that preterm for some aspects of vision, preterm infants had better response than full-term infants, not only at the same gestational age at 40 weeks, but even 35, at, at 30, 35 weeks, PREMs <coughs> were doing better than full-term infants. So the one who thought that PREMs were better are right on this. But on other aspects, uh, it was the other way around. The full-term infants, uh, well, term infants, irrespective of whether they were PREMs or full terms, behaved better than at 35 weeks. Why is this so? Well, it's relatively easy. We have three different trends, uh, and th these trends are probably due to different mechanisms. In some items, uh, being prem born before 30 and arriving at 35 or even more at 40 means that you had a lot of uh, extra uterine exposure. So you have a lot of visual experience. Uh, so if you have this visual experience, these extra weeks uh, of, uh, if the system, this if the underlying system is very basic, a subcortical system, the experience will help you. So if the response is a very basic response, subcortical response, uh, having more experience will help you. So for these items, uh, the time of extra uterine exposure was helping. Uh, but other aspects uh, were better in, in term infants. Uh, and probably these are related because you need more maturation of the cortical uh, structures. So for, ad for some other aspects, uh, <coughs> you don't need the experience, but you need proper maturation of the brain. So this was very helpful to understand that uh, for some aspects, uh, probably it was mainly the subcortical system working and the experience was helping, while for other aspects, uh, experience did not help because uh, at 35 weeks they were not doing better, but it was really a problem of maturation. So um, the, this was quite uh, 
exciting, and we were also surprised on how many children were able to complete the full assessment at 35 weeks. So we didn't get enough, so we thought, can we push this a little bit more? So we say, how early can be this early assessment? So we started at 28 weeks, and at the beginning it was a disaster because uh, children between 28 and 31 weeks could not be reliably assessed. Some of them completed the assessment, very few of them. It was difficult to find them in the right state. So what we found at the end was that before 31 weeks, most infants could not be reliably assessed. This doesn't mean that no child can be assessed, but you cannot be uh, reliable in, in your assessment. Uh, well, after 31 weeks, uh, most <coughs> infants could be assessed and they showed progressive maturation. And I'm not going to show you all the details, uh, but what I want to show you here is these are the, uh, the different items and you can see that uh, below the age of 31, most children were here not suitable for clinical issues. So they were really unstable. They really didn't like to be tested. Uh, and then after 31 weeks, you can see there is a maturation uh, but uh, uh, they, they, can be they can be already tested. Uh, and uh, in for some aspects, there was a very nice maturation uh, and so on. So um, in conclusion on this part, uh, what, uh, what do we want to say? That it's not difficult to assess children. It's not difficult to assess visual function. But then the questions are two. And uh, before we had the results I'm going to show you now, the, 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 the questions were, how reliable are these measures, what are we measuring, and how uh, informative they are of later visual function. And the first question was addressed in uh, a study we did in collaboration with, uh, with a group in London where they uh, performed the tractography of the optic radiation in PREMS infant term age, and they also <coughs> performed Daniela's assessment at the same time. And uh, um, it was done in 37 preterm infants at term equivalent age, uh, and uh, they were doing tractography of the optic radiation. And the results showed a very nice correlation of the value of uh, tractography and the visual assessment. So uh, there is a correlation. You know, this was very, very important to understand that what we were measuring clinically really was also correlated with the maturation of the optic radiation. And uh, I want to finish with these two slides. Uh, um, this is part of the slide, rather. So this is a paper that we published recently on uh, uh, cortical visual function in PREMS in the first year. Now, uh, I didn't put the results of this, of this, um, of this um, paper, but uh, it was very nice to see that most PREMS uh, at uh, one year of age were able to complete the whole assessment. And the only aspect which was difficult to assess uh, was, at, uh, was the fixation shift, was the visual attention. And uh, then if you follow these children, you know that these children all often developed, if not a complete ADHD, they will, do, they will have attention problems at pre in preschool and at preschool. So we do have an idea that uh, the tests we are using the first year are uh, an indication of, uh, um, of uh, later visual attention. But uh, we also wanted to know how the early tests uh, we, uh, we do in the neonatal period are uh, a, a prognostic can, can give us indications on what happens in one year and later. So there is a, a study which has just, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. There is a study that's just been published. I, ye yesterday night I didn't have the, the proofs at home, uh, or, or, but uh, it's published in, in early human development. It's just been published. And uh, it was very nice because in this study we compared the early neonatal to the assessment at one year. And we found that, again, as we have seen for other aspects, uh, when you have a normal visual assessment at term age, this was an excellent predictor of normal visual function at one year. So this test can already predict uh, in the early uh, days, uh, soon after birth, what will happen at one year. And we know that these tests are predictive of what happens at school age. So you know this, this, this becomes all, all together and very exciting. And uh, uh, in contrast, you have to be a bit more careful when you have some abnormalities of, of visual function in the neonatal period, because in a proportion of them, these children may not be completely well and may be, you know, some, some uh, positive results on this test may be due to general condition. But this, this, this was only in a minority, but this can happen. So why do we think this is important? Because if you have an early marker of possible visual function, you can start all, only all early rehabilitation. And uh, um, we now know a lot of things uh, on how we can combine 
MRI techniques and all this visual function to recognize early aspects of visual impairment. Uh, and we do think that rehabilitation has uh, a role in, uh, in visual. Uh, again, I, I, I know Daniela is hating me for quoting her so much, but uh, we have developed over the years a number of easy tools that can be given or suggested to parents uh, to stimulate children with visual attention already. And, and parents feel so much better if they go home and they know that they can use uh, these stupid, apparently stupid things to stimulate the child and children can go better. And we have uh, nice results that children really improve their visual attention if you use some rehabilitation. And this tool, again, the tools we, we are choosing, the tools we use are, are nothing fancy, are all things that we homemade or you can make, you know, with. Uh, at Easter time, there is the paper wrapping the, the eggs that's perfect for uh, refraction and other things, uh, and all these box sets and so on. So the, the message I want you to go home uh, with today is that uh, all these things are easy, and uh, vision is important not only just for vision, but because vision is essential for learning things uh, uh, always, but especially in the first year of life. So vision is related to development, and if you recognize early aspects of vision impairment and you start early rehabilitation, you have much better chances of reducing the impairment. So all these things are easy, and uh, whoever is interested, the papers and materials and other things are, are available. Thank you. Do you have any data about uh, the phenomenon of habituation when you put uh, a, a target and you see it's the same target after some minutes and uh, the infants is uh, still a surprise? Yeah, the, the if you change the target, uh, I mean, with, with such a short uh, uh, examination, you don't have habituation. We have done some, uh, when, we, when I was in London with Jan Atkinson, we have done some studies on habituation, but it generally comes uh, after a while. Uh, the, the trick of doing a good examination is that it has to be very short, and if you see that the child is tiring, you, start, you, you switch to something else, and then you come back and you finish the, the stripes or whatever you are doing. But with such a short examination, it doesn't happen very often. In Israel, we have a toy, it's called mobile. It's something hangs, mm -hmm. and there are toys hung on it. And it makes sound as well it moves around. Does that have any effect on the vision part of it? it sure, it's, a, it's a, a good stimulus, and we, we suggest all the mobiles and so on. Uh, the problem is that if you want to simulate just the visual part, uh, uh, we usually try not to encourage too much um, uh, noises that come with, you know, sounds that comes with the toy. Otherwise, the child will follow the noise. Uh, so, or, or you can use it if the child is unable to follow the toy as a, uh, an additional help. But uh, um, this is just one. I mean, man, many of these things, with, uh, actually, there was a very nice booklet by Patricia Songsen at the time when she was working at GOS, uh, giving all these instructions, and we have uh, a bit expanded the idea of Patricia, is that you, you can really use uh, simple things at home to, to improve the way the children will go from the center to the side or, from, or to be aware that things are happening to the side. And children with stroke, uh, sometimes we have uh, not, not just hemianopsia, but what we see is neglect. Uh, sometimes you have a, a normal occipital cortex, uh, the child is able to see, to have normal visual fields, but they have neglect because of the parietal lobe involvement. Uh, and these are the cases where training uh, and uh, what I call stupid, but they're not stupid at all, S stupid in terms of simple exercise from the parents make a lot of improvement. When they come back after three months, uh, you can see that sometimes they have the, the opposite problems. They, you know, they pester the child on one side and they forget about the other one. So you have always to be careful in what you suggest. Uh, but it's uh, uh, all, all the, the, these toys are things that you can create in, uh, with, with your own computer or you can buy normal shops. It's, it's nothing fancy, really. I found fascinating this examination, but I think if you are developing a screening test, you have to be sure that when you have a negative result, it does have a meaning. You have shown that around 30% of your infant do not complete the test. That means that you are sending parents home, telling them the test wasn't okay, 
which actually meant it doesn't have any meaning. No, 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 there, w there, w there wasn't, uh, well, it was not 30%, it was much less, but uh, what I said, they did not complete it on the first round. I don't think there is a, simple, a single test in the neonatal unit, including the neurological examination, when you go and you just find the child in the ideal state. Uh, I mean, how many times we have to go back to a neonate because he's crying and you cannot complete the neurological examination? What I was saying is that we were I amazed of how easy it was to perform on the first round, but in a minority, we had to go back and complete it on the second occasion. But this applies to all the other tests, uh, you know, even with the ultrasound, sometimes the children are so upset that we decide to do it later. Uh, your tests with the preterm are really interesting in the sense that you can, you can find that these babies modulate their, let me, let me just put it in, in my words because I'm not quite sure I understand how, how you did all these things, but modulate their vision based on their preterm exposure. Basically, they learn how to see, if you like, uh, yeah. because they've been born preterm. Now that raises a really interesting question because there's a great um, movement around the world, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> to do developmental care and keep these kids in the dark I all know. the time. And is that actually not good? Because if they are able, I mean, I guess the quote you could ask the question either way: Is it bad that they learn how to see, mm -hmm. or is it bad that you don't allow them to learn how to see because you keep them in the dark all the time? I, I think there is a balance between being in the dark and being uh, overexposed to noises and too much movement. So, so even babies who are kept in the dark, uh, they are exposed to some visual experience because they are not uh, 24 hours taken into the dark and sometimes, you know, they, they are changed, they are things. Right. And, uh, uh, we actually looked at the difference between our data in Rome, where, where the children are not kept in the dark, and the children in Milan, who, who were kept in the dark, and there was little difference. So the, there, there is still some experience. Uh, I think the, uh, as, as, uh, as always, uh, I think going to the opposite doesn't help. So I don't think it, it's helpful to keep them completely in the dark uh, at all times, uh, and, uh, but it's not nice to keep them overexposed because you know the children who are overexposed to too much noise, too much light, uh, they tend to shut down even more than the one who are in the dark. Uh, so I think it's a matter of finding a good balance and uh, when we assess the children, we always uh, uh, ask uh, for the light to be uh, a bit down uh, with we and, uh, and we try to do it in a, a safe environment without too many people around or too much noise. So uh, I think, you know, it, we should really try to find a good balance between uh, not keeping them completely in the dark but not, uh, not keeping them in the, in the noise or, uh, or with too many lights and visual stimuli. So a balance will help. But we haven't found too much difference. Uh, uh, but in Milan, they kept keep them in the dark most of the day, I think. Uh. Uh, I think it was so exciting to hear about the visual rehabilitation and uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the results. As we know, our very preterm infants, they perform poorly at the age of five years and affects their visual based performance IQ. Uh, so are there control trials how rehabilitation may affect on la late on-term run? Uh, no, we, we, we think very often to do trials on these and um, in uh, practically whenever we see that a child is in trouble, we don't feel ethically uh, um, happy to to say, well, let's see what happens to this one if we don't give him any support. So it's a sort of automatic pilot that we give immediately suggestion to the parents. But uh, I can tell you the other way around that uh, ir irrespective of when we see these children, because many of, the, uh, well, all the children I, I spoke uh, in the in today about uh, are part of a longitudinal follow-up. We do see many other children who arrive at different ages. Uh, and we do see that when we start uh, giving uh, uh, the, these easy suggestions on uh, how to stimulate with, uh, um, with, uh, with these things, uh, we do see an, an improvement. So we are quite, I mean, I, I know that a trial is what we should do, a, a proper randomized controlled trial, but uh, first we, uh, 
uh, well, we, we should do it. You are right, but it's difficult to do it. <laughs> when you think, when you, when you have the gut feeling that it's working, you you feel bad if you if you if you don't do something to chil to the other children, you know. So. Okay. Thank you then.